law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, and I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of a God with whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. And according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of his wife's womb, Sarah, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his face, and he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, his faith has reckoned to him righteousness. In other words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but also for ours. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over in death to our tres for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Our second scripture reading, the one we're going to be focusing on today in our sermon, is from Mark 8, 31-38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo a great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed after three days, rise again. And he said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking to his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And he called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will profit to gain the whole world and forfeit their own life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Today's scripture, there's a important piece going on here that I hope that we will all really deeply consider. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? That's it. What does it mean? What does it require of you? What does it require to you to say publicly to be a follower of Christ? In Peter's defense, some things were easier back then. It was easier to say that somebody was not following God or living an adulterous life when there were so many temples, right? And the temples would be built up for different sort of demigods or situations. You could say, I don't go to that temple. I don't go to that party. I don't partake in that feast. That's not my customs. And it was easy to point to that and say, that's not me. I'm not a sinner. And I think our generation is still quite guilty of that today. We can say things like, I don't do that. I'm still a Christian. I would never. I'm a Christian. Oh, no. No, no. I make sure on Christmas to give away stuff, too. I'm a Christian. We easily come into this place to say, I'm a Christian. Because the gospel is really clear at the end not to deny God. So quickly, we come to our own defenses and we say, I'm not denying God. Don't worry. God is still there. Anybody ever met somebody that feels like a superficial Christian? Yeah, 
I think we know what that feels like. You know what it feels like for somebody to say, I'm a Christian, I go to church every Sunday, and I donate this once a week. I'm good to go. Check that off my list. Heaven, here I come. It feels blasé, right? It doesn't dive deep into the heart or the soul of a person. Why do you say that? Because in regular conversations, we're not talking about God. We're not talking about faith. We're gossiping. We're gossiping about anything from the news to politics. We're gossiping about, um, oh gosh, anything. The NFL players, we're gossiping about Taylor Swift. We're gossiping about, we gossip about people. We gossip about people at church. We gossip about that dysfunctional family down the block. We gossip, we gossip, we gossip. But don't worry. We've shown up to church on Sunday. We're good. Check that box. No, we are just as guilty as our ancestors 2,000 years ago. And probably the 2,000 years before that. Maybe in the caveman days it was harder to gossip because y'all lived in caves and we didn't have as much dialect and you could draw pictures. Maybe then we were less guilty of this sin because we didn't let our faith sink deeper. Some will say, oh, I wear a cross. This cross, and, it's, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, I don't like to wear a cross a lot. It's not my thing. Um, Jorgen Moltmann talks about this. Uh, German um, theologian, and he talks about the theology of the cross, and he never liked putting roses or flowers on a cross. He said the cross, the original reason why we started wearing it was a symbol of rebellion. It was a symbol of my God suffered for us, and I'm going to suffer for you. That's what the cross meant. Now, to compare that in common day times, that would be like an innocent person, somebody jailed for a crime they didn't commit, and then they were had the electric chair, and they were electrified, and then you all deciding to wear electric chair crosses. Anybody doing that? Little chains of electric chairs on there? No. But to them, that's what it meant. And we know at one time prior to Jesus, there was a massacre of 2,000 Galileans who were crucified. So the symbol of the cross was a curse. It was a death you would not want. But don't worry, I have my beautiful silver cross and it's got a little diamond in there, check. How superficial we become. That faith is becomes a checkbox. I do this, check. I do that, check. So then when Jesus enters our life and enters into Peter's life, and Peter's like, don't tell everybody you're going to suffer and die on a cross. Don't say that. It kind of reminds me of what you say to young women. Don't tell her she's going to suffer. Just tell her to be over quick. I know you're out there. I heard that lie. Not from you guys, but from another church. They definitely lied to me about what you'd suffer. Not helpful. Uh, don't tell that woman she's going to suffer. Shh. It'll be over before you know it. Check. That's not the truth, right? That's not reality. That's what you wanted. And in all fairness, in Peter's mind, his people had suffered a very, very long time. His people had had been crucified, over 2,000 on one occasion. The same Roman Empire that did all of this also had pagan worships and the parties that were disgusting. They did all of that. Peter wasn't ready to keep suffering. And in fact, the fact that Peter rebukes Jesus, I think, makes him an honest fellow. Peter didn't want to see his God suffer. Peter was done with suffering. Peter was exhausted. He was ready to see the King of David, the Davidic throne restored. He was ready for the Garden of Eden. He was done. And if he saw that Jesus suffered, what did that mean for his own life? That he too would have to suffer in some way. He was not excited about this. I think he was a fairly honest guy. And he says to Jesus, no, not that talk off. Not helpful. But I'm not seeing major growth, whether 
be a tiny little seed or a child or an animal or a tree or anything in nature grow without a little bit of struggle. Now, struggle doesn't always mean suffering. I think what Jesus endured in the 40 days was a struggle. I think we've all struggled. But Jesus, he suffered because he didn't want you to struggle. It's the difference between Lent and Christmas. Christmas, we sing songs from the scripture that say, come and see what I have done. And so God brings a child into the world a king born in a manger sets a different tone for the world. God is life and creation. And Lent and Easter, it's different. It's now a new covenant. A change has taken place. That beautiful innocence has suffered. In wars, who is it that suffers the most? The children, right? And when Paul brought up the Russians, I'm, I'm glad, you know, we're trying to combat all the evilness, but whenever we do another tariff or another sanction, who's going to suffer the most? The children. <clears throat> it's a reality. And more women and children are the biggest casualty. So did Jesus pull a blind eye and say, I'm here, everybody. Let's just have this party, forget our problems, and I'll snap my fingers and everybody will do what they're told. He lived in that grief. He lived in that suffering. He told one of his best friends, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. This is going to happen. Not because I don't care, but because I do care. Because what you do matters. Because every time we break a covenant, God suffers with us, feels the pain with us. Your suffering matters to God. It does. So Jesus lays this tough line down, and Peter and him have it out. And they're arguing and the combating gets a little bit louder. So in the Greek terminology, when he turns, he says it so everyone in earshot can hear it. So if you're going to gossip, Jesus wants to make sure you gossip about the right things. So let's read what Jesus said in earshot. He called the crowd with his disciples, a.k.a. everybody was listening, and said to them, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. He goes on. So if the crowd is going to gossip, they better gossip about the right things. I know theologically the scripture has been used to do a lot of harm. A lot of historically pastors have used this scripture. Um, you guys, we're not suffering enough, right? Like the pastors will use it to manipulate, to get money, or whatever. That's not my goal here. I think that's wrong, and it's manipulation. And I think that Jesus suffered so we could have a healthy struggle. <laughs> so we could have a fighting chance at changing this world. Some will be called to be martyrs, and some will know that. Um, Mulvaney didn't say, if I die. He said, when I die. When I die. Some know their calling, and they will rely on God's grace and strength throughout that. Now, I'm not thinking most of us are called to that, so I will never use scripture to manipulate someone. That has to come directly from God, and that's a special kind of calling. But I am calling on you all to struggle a little. And to pick up your own cross means what? It means you have to free your hands of some other stuff, right? So that's why in the season of Lent, we traditionally give up something. To pick up your cross means to free your hands and your life for something new. 
And I have broken Lent a few times this year. It's been real rough. Uh, but to give up sugar, to give up dessert, means I have to find other ways to comfort myself. It means I read my scripture more. It means I call a friend or send a positive emoji. <laughs> That's the end of life. It means I have to do other things. To pick up my cross means to let go of something. It could be superficial. It could be I brag to everybody about what I do for Lent. It could be up here. But to go deep means to drop this and to pick up this. And oftentimes when you pick up your cross, you will not be appreciated. You just won't. Why? Because you're stirring up drama. You're doing things you're not supposed to be doing. Here's my favorite one. <laughs> Moms, you're not supposed to yell at your kids. You're just supposed to give them candy and be there and love them. How's that working out for that generation? Huh? No! Sometimes moms get a little angry. Sometimes moms lay it out. <laughs> Sometimes mom wants you to know not to run in the parking lot before you learn the hard way. Beating a mom isn't always sweet. But what I liked about the book today was the grandparent gets to be a little sweet, right? The cute little raisins. And there is a sweetness to grandparents who are like, calm down, it'll work out. This is just puberty. It gets better. It doesn't mean the suffering's not real, but it does mean there's a sweetness to come. And sometimes people will say, and I'd like to point this out, this is my other final thing I wanted to share. Because when I was praying, I realized, you know, some people will say, you don't need to read the Old Testament, just read the New Testament. The Old Testament gets too confusing. Last week when we talked about books, that letter, it was written in code. And some people say, don't read the stuff in code, you'll read too much into it, you'll make it to mean things it doesn't. And they'll say, the Old Testament God and the New Testament God are not the same God. And I've heard that argument but many, many times. Here's, what I, here's my argument. The way we experience God changes from a young parent who's super annoyed at their kids to the New Testament grandparent who's like, relax. Doesn't matter how bad you sin, how bad it gets, I love you. It doesn't matter if you're my grandkid or the grandkid down the street or the grandkid of Russia or Ukraine or in the Holy Lands. I love you. Maybe the New Testament God, we come to understand as a grandparent's eternal love. A yummy little raisin. No? Nobody likes raisins? <laughs> All right. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we thank you for the scriptures. I pray that this group and this congregation will have time to think on your word, time to think about perceptions, time to think about what it means to drop something and to pick up their own cross, a time to think about faith going deeper than the surface, a time for faith to be more than what we show off. Or, Lord, I just ask that you would come deep within our hearts and find ways for us to struggle in healthy, growing ways. Knowing full well, Lord, that you paid the ultimate price. And we no longer have to die because you did for us. In your name, amen. All right. It looks like, oh, we usually have a song at the end, but we don't today. All right, let me offer this final benediction. The journey of Jesus took him into a world of suffering, rejection, and death. And as we go into the same world, embolden us, O Creator, that we too may take up our cross and follow you. Teach us to ask not that you shield us from temptation, but that you keep us from evil in temptation's midst. In your name, amen. Go in peace, everyone, and enjoy some donuts. Yes. <laughs>